America's Heartland is made possible by the United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KBIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. Hi there, I'm Rob Stewart. Do you buy your produce at the local farmer's market? Well, a growing number of people are doing that these days. So coming up, we'll take you down south to Alabama to see how some farmers are meeting consumer demands with fruits and vegetables grown close to home. Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Have you ever thought about becoming a farmer or a rancher? We'll head to New Mexico to take part in a unique program that helps people get a start in agriculture. Hi, I'm Sharon Vaknin. Sweet corn is a summer favorite, but what if we show you some recipes where we kick in some spice when we serve it up? We have some unusual sweet corn recipes you're gonna wanna serve up at your house. Hi, I'm Jason Schultz. Coming up next, a cattle roundup, but this time we're not headed out west. We're gonna go to the state of Florida. Take a trip with us to find out about a heritage breed known as Cracker Cattle. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. close to the land. Many of the animals on farms and ranches across the heartland can trace their roots back to explorers arriving here in the Americas. And here in Florida, one unique breed of cattle has been roaming the countryside since the 1500s. <laughs> These cattle grazing in the brushy Florida pasture have a name, and unless you're a Florida native, that name might just catch you off guard. These are cracker cattle. And William and Margaret Broussard are proud of this heritage breed of cattle that they're preserving here at the Crescent J Ranch. William Broussard is a 10th generation cattleman. Without his family's efforts and those of other ranchers in the Sunshine State, this historic breed might just have ended up as a footnote in the agricultural history of America. We decided to take part in trying to save the breed, which is critically endangered. There's not enough of them to assure their survival. So we uh, got started in the early 80s uh, working on that. The original Cracker cattle breed was brought to Florida by explorer Ponce de Leon in the 1500s. They wandered the swampy, brushy countryside for hundreds of years. Decades back, ranchers used cow hunters to work these herds. Preserving that ranching story is the job of Chester Newcomb. At the Lake Kissimmee State Park, Chester takes visitors back to the late 1800s when cracker cattle roamed the countryside. This part of Florida, we look at almost 300 years before man started to put a brand on a cow. I mean, one of the reasons they called us cow hunters. You go out in the swamp here trying to find a cow be like trying to find hair with the belly of a frog, you know? The cracker name actually traces back to the way that the cow hunters rounded up these bovine by cracking their whips. And of course, you'll find in the big cities now, folks are starting to call us crackers instead of cow hunters. 
As other cattle breeds were introduced and breeding improved, the original cracker cattle began disappearing, replaced with larger animals. It wasn't until they were almost extinct in the 1960s that an effort began to save the cracker breed. For the Broussards, preserving the cattle breed and the ecology here have a deeply personal meaning. In 1990, their 29-year-old son, Alan, died of an infection following a heart transplant. Before Alan died, he had a conversation with his father in the hospital. We got you talking a lot about the land just south of what, was the Cres what is the Crescent J Ranch, which was pretty much in good natural condition and how rare that was getting and how important it was to save things like that. And so uh, he asked me if I couldn't do something so that weekend, I promised him I was going to do my best to do that. As you see up ahead over here, that one bull picking up the dust and dirt. That promise is realized every day as visitors tour the grounds of this nearly 5,000 acre ranch and preserve. A low environmental impact adventure park helps pay for the property and helps ensure the land will stay preserved for future generations. Would Alan be proud of his dream being realized? I would think so. His widow said yes, he would be proud of that, but the thing he would be most proud of is the way he changed his father's attitude. <laughs> A father's enduring love for his son, forever linked to the enduring effort to save a breed of cattle with a history that stretches hundreds of years. Branding cattle didn't start in the Old West. Early Egyptians were branding their livestock more than 2,000 years ago. There are more than a billion cows in the world. India alone has some 300 million. And just be glad that cows don't drive. Cattle are red-green colorblind. Getting a start in farming requires you to take on new skills and a commitment to hard work. So where do you begin? Well, here in New Mexico, a special program helps students get their interest off the ground. These residents from the small New Mexico town of Chaparral are taking the first steps to acquire farming skills. Growing their own fruits and vegetables will not only benefit the economically disadvantaged community, but help overcome the challenge of getting fresh produce when the nearest supermarket is nearly an hour away. And so we partnered with other community-based organizations here in Chaparral to, to start a uh, demonstration farm as a means of, of educating local residents about the types and crops and how to grow them. The training underway in Chaparral is being funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and taught through an extension program at New Mexico State University. It's locally known as El Solar. El Solar is a Spanish name for backyard garden. More than two dozen students at a time will work on this demonstration farm, learning a variety of skills from proper planting to efficient irrigation. We've relied on uh, the expertise of uh, a number of individuals who have had experience with the drip, and, and it is, it's, it, it's, uh, we couldn't do this without, a, without the drip system, just not enough water in the area to yeah. produce like this. Well, and, and you were pointing out to me earlier, obviously the chili will be fine because yeah. they thrive yeah. in the hot temperatures sure. and the sure. drier earth and as well as the tomatoes, but yeah. you, you don't get a stand of lettuce like this without the drip <laughs> irrigation system. It's no, absolutely beautiful. The, the drip beautiful. is very instrumental in, in keeping our, our leafy crops going this long, and, and of course we can provide shade as we need to, as we've done with our radishes over there. And, and so yeah, it, the drip is, allows us too to provide a variety of crops and, and regulate the water on each of the crops. A number of extension instructors assist with the agricultural education efforts. First, you have to teach how to grow organic, and for them to see the process from planting all the way through selling the product. And more than anything, to teach them so that they can go and do it at their home. One person who has benefited greatly from the course is Esperanza Briones. She's turned her property into a farm that's filled with fresh produce. So tell me about uh, the skills that you've learned in the urban farm. Que le diga de las habilidades que ha aprendido del solar. 
Pues, uh, uh, como a conservar, como I've learned to conserve water with this en, irrigation en, system. And it looks like it's paid off for the family because not only do you have fruits and vegetables that you feed your family, but you also sell a lot of what you grow. Pues, I do sell poco, a little bit, and my husband bien. helps me a lot. So my biggest satisfaction is that I can provide for my family. Younger apprentice farmers are also active in the program. The thing that I enjoy the most is probably helping our community do something with our land that we have here. And what I enjoy most is planting the plants and watching them grow so later on we can eat them. You're going to take all this to the farmer's market in Las Cruces mostly? Yeah. Another aspect of the training helps the new farmers see opportunities for marketing the produce they won't use themselves. You have to be able to, to market your product. You have to be able to you know, plan ahead in terms of what you're going to market. And, and it's not simply a matter of growing it and getting rid of it. You know, there has to be a little bit of a business plan in place. The farming skills learned here provide not only the opportunity for economic benefits, but also show how agriculture can benefit the entire community. Instructors here hope programs like this can be successful in other areas, giving residents new opportunities to improve their diets and take a step towards self-sustainability. Ideally, we'd see more and more individuals that have the desire to uh, start to grow fruits and, and, and uh, vegetables on a scale that they can market to local grocers and or create in their own farmer's market. That would certainly be an uh, indication of success in Chaparral to have a vibrant farmer's market right here in Chaparral. Sitting around 7,000 feet, New Mexico's capital of Santa Fe is the highest state capital in the U.S. And while all states have a state bird or state flower, New Mexico also has a state question. It's red or green, relating to your choice of chilies to spice up your food in the land of enchantment. I'm Sharon Vaknin. Still ahead, we'll go from farm to fork with some tried and true recipes using the very tasty sweet corn. I'm Rob Stewart and still ahead, let's go to Alabama to meet some local farmers who are meeting consumer demand for produce grown close to home. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. If you were putting together a meal that was fit for a king, or if you just wanted to dine with Julius Caesar or Cleopatra, asparagus would definitely have been on the menu. These thin green stalks had been a sought after vegetable for thousands of years, and even better for you home gardeners, once you plant this vegetable, you can just sit back and wait for the harvest again and again. That's because the asparagus plant is a perennial. Started with seed, farmers usually harvest their first crop after three years. But once planted, the asparagus plant can produce those tasty stalks for years and years. You'll find depictions of asparagus in ancient Egyptian wall decorations. The name itself is reported to have come from the Greek translation of a Persian word meaning shoot or sprout. As early as 200 BC, Roman writers had suggestions on how to effectively grow the plant. In fact, some Roman emperors were so enamored of the vegetable, they kept special ships to deliver asparagus to Rome from growing fields in the north of Italy. Early colonists brought asparagus to the New World, where its ability to grow in less than ideal soil conditions made it possible to keep green vegetables on the table even in less than perfect weather. Asparagus plants can be either male or female. The male plants grow larger, female plants grow uh, seeds to produce new growing stock for the next season. And finally, good news for dieters, asparagus has no fat, no cholesterol, and is low in sodium. So enjoy. varieties of sweet corn, but most people only think about it as white or yellow corn. Rick, you grow both. Yeah, we grow one variety of white and one variety of yellow. So tell me a little bit about Davis Ranch. Davis Ranch started as uh, Ed Davis Ranch in 1966. He was one that mapped all that out and figured it out so that we could have 
sweet corn over a long period of time. Even though we plant it in February, it starts somewhere about the end of June, no matter what. And then it ends up sometime in November. The first frost will kill it off. Well, this corn is so good right off the cob, but I do have a couple of dishes that highlight this delicious sweet corn flavor. I'm making a mango and sweet corn salad plus zucchini and sweet corn fritters. What are you making? I'm gonna boil a sweet corn. I'm gonna show you how to do it where you don't kill it. Wow, all right, nice <laughs> and pure, I like it. Okay, so let's get started. First, we are going to want to chop up our butter lettuce. Why don't you slice up this mango, throw it right into our salad bowl. And now I'm going to dice up this red bell pepper. We are going to get to our star ingredient now, your beautiful sweet corn that you picked today. Now, all I'm going to do in order to preserve the flavor is grill it up a little bit. And we're gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Oh, look at that, see? That's the brown color we want. And just sprinkle that cayenne pepper. All right, well, these guys cool, let's make our dressing. A little white balsamic vinegar. All right, you cut that lemon in half and squeeze the juice out of half of it. I'm gonna add Dijon mustard. Of course, salt. Last but not least, we need to do our olive oil. You whisk while I pour. The next thing we need to do is take the kernels off the cob. I've got some herbs to chop. So I have basil and mint. Why don't you go ahead and toss this salad and I'll drizzle in some of that dressing. Rick, you're gonna show me the purest way to prepare corn. All you wanna do is put enough water in this pot to cover those ears. Okay. Now what? Turn it up on high. Put the lid on it. And wait, wait, you don't wanna salt it? No. All right, this water is definitely boiling now. We want three minutes and they are coming okay. out. All you wanna do is get them warm. Okay, covered? Yep. All right, let's do it. They should look exactly like they were when they went in, except they're hot. <laughs> I'm gonna use your sweet corn in zucchini and sweet corn fritters with a little twist. I'll show you what that is. But first, we're going to add three quarters of a cup of corn flour and one quarter cup of all-purpose flour in this bowl. Then we're going to add a quarter teaspoon of baking powder, garlic powder, and salt. Mix these up a little bit. Half a cup of milk, and I'm going to scramble one egg. You can get started grating this zucchini. This is my secret weapon. A cup of pepper jack cheese. I'm going to slice up some green onion. And if you can also get started getting the kernels off that corn. What is that? It's a kernel removing tool that I brought. <laughs> it kind of holds itself off the cob just about right. Okay. Yeah, that looks good. And now we're just gonna mix this all together. So I think we're ready to fry these up. Okay. Since we're frying, I'm gonna put an apron on. Do you want one too? <laughs> no, I'm fine. So I would say it's about two to three minutes on each side. That dark golden brown color is exactly what you want. Do you wanna give it a try? No, I don't have the apron on. <laughs> uh, oh, this is gonna look good. Perfect. Let's dig in. Okay. Oh, these fritters are so fresh and crispy. I like that, it's good. Yeah, can you taste the slight cheesiness in there? I wanna try some of the salad, see how it turned out. Is that the dill in the salad that I'm tasting? What is it? You know what it is? It's the basil and the mint. That's what I really wanted to do, is highlight your delicious sweet corn. So tell me how that is. Mmm. This way, isn't it? <laughs> and you know what? The yellow corn does have a slightly different taste than the white corn. Yes, it does. It still has a, the old-time corn taste to it. Cheers to your pure sweet corn. Mmm. While native tribes in the Americas have been eating sweet corn for thousands of years, significant commercial production really didn't begin until the 1700s. 
And if you're thinking of planting some, one acre of good farmland can produce about 14,000 pounds of sweet corn. Fresh is the watchword when it comes to marketing local produce, and that's part of the reason why farmers markets are booming across the country. You know, local and state governments have done their part to promote farmers markets, and now farmers are taking the lead on getting crops to consumers. It's early morning, and while many folks are still in bed, Alabama peach farmer Jimmy Witt has been up for hours, readying his daily deliveries for market. You get up 3, 3.30, uh, it's, it's a 45 minute drive there. So, uh, you know, I like to give myself an hour. But Jimmy's not the only Alabama farmer up before the sun. Dozens of other local growers start their day headed for one particular farmer's market. The public wants local products, so as long as you're Alabama farmer, you have somewhere to sell. Um, if you grow your product here locally, you can come here and sell year-round every day. <laughs> Ain't nothing we can do about it. He doesn't got his mind made up. The Alabama Farmers Market began with 18 growers back in 1921. Today, a much larger number of growers sell their produce, wholesale and retail, on a sprawling 49-acre site in West Birmingham that's been home to the market for more than a half century. Owned and operated by Alabama farmers, the market generates some $350 million in annual sales. Normally on a daily basis, we would have anywhere from 75 to 100 farmers here. But on an annual basis, we, could, we would have um, 300 to 500 farmers use this market to sell their product. There's a lot of uh, uh, people that have restaurants that, that do show up there and to buy fresh produce for their restaurants. Lots of wholesale produce stands come in there early in the morning, buy their uh, produce they need for that day or the next day. Hello, Jerry. Hi. We like your pictures. Oh. One wholesaler buying from Jimmy this morning is Dorothy Orrick. She'll spend $500 on his peaches because of the quality produce she's purchased from Jimmy in the past. It's just really important because it's fresh. You know, they just pick it. It's real fresh. And we always want to try to keep our customers happy. Birmingham chef Matt Jones says the market allows him to find fresh vegetables and support local growers. Certain vegetables are sweeter than others. Some are more tart, you know, just depending on the location and where they're at, you know, self-sustained farms are, you know, very important with uh, the flavors and stuff you get from your vegetables. Some of the farmers will actually take orders from their uh, steady customers. The customers say, hold me a box. They'll actually hold that customer a box of whatever they're looking for. While the experience of finding locally grown produce has long been a tradition here, that consumer connection has grown dramatically in all 50 states. The U.S. Department of Agriculture listed fewer than 1,800 farmers markets nationwide in 1994. Today, to meet a growing consumer demand for locally grown fresh foods, there are just under 8,000. Most of what they're looking for is they're looking for something quality and looking for something fresh. State and local governments have jumped on the bandwagon to create and support farmers markets. The efforts not only bring in tax dollars, but also provide sales outlets for newer farmers just starting out. But the growers here at the Alabama Farmers Market are very proud of one distinction that helps set them apart. It's one of the only uh, farmer-owned farmers markets left in the United States, and that, which is, is very unique. After Jimmy Witt drops his delivery, he's back on his farm, where his family's been picking peaches and other produce since the 1950s. Like many growers, he has a contractor who sells his produce so he can prepare for the next day. Whether it's peaches or okra or strawberries or you know, uh, whatever it might be. And the cycle starts again in both Alabama and at thousands of farmers markets across the country. Consumers finding fresh produce and farmers enjoying the fruits of their labor. You got so many options to be able to sell to the public, the, uh, the, the um, warehouses, the um, grocery stores. Just the opportunity is so wide here. If you have grow a quality product, you will be able to sell it. 
And that's going to do it for us this time. We thank you for traveling the country with us on this edition of America's Heartland. We're always so pleased that you can join us as we travel the country to find fascinating people and interesting places. And remember, you can stay in touch with us 24-7. We make it easy for you. You can find us on some of your favorite sites. You can also access our stories and video on our website, americasheartland.org. That'll do it for this time. We hope to see you on the next America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland, living close to the land There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand In America's heartland, living close, close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by the United Soybean Board, whose Common Ground program creates conversations to help consumers get the facts about farming and food. There's more at findourcommonground.com. The American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture, dedicated to building greater awareness and understanding of agriculture through education and engagement. More information at agfoundation.org. Farm Credit, Financing agriculture and rural America since 1916. Farm Credit is cooperatively owned by America's farmers and ranchers. Learn more at farmcredit.com. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following.